Okay, so I finally got this installed. Um, I've kind of half assedly set up my controls. I might be prone to forget them for a while. Um, I've only got the most basic things set up. We're going to give this a bit of a go and see how it is. I have done about two or three quick flights just to check that my graphic settings aren't going to kill my PC and get kind of a feel for it. Um, but otherwise, I haven't really spent any time in the game. Um, I'm just flying the Spitfire in a quick dogfight here because I'm familiar with the Spitfire, so I have an idea of what it should feel like. Um, and I, you know, know how to use it to some degree. We can see here the modification system um, that first appeared in Rise of Flight, which I really enjoyed in Rise of Flight. It added some uh, some additional gameplay, made it interesting, try out different combinations. Um, you know, some cosmetic upgrades, some that were actually functional and some that were basically pointless, like the Lewis gun upgrade for a lot of the German fighters. Now here it's pretty limited, at least for the Spitfire. Uh, we get to have a Merlin 45, which um, I'm not actually sure what difference that makes. I don't think it makes any. It might just be um, a different altitude optimization because I'm not sure exactly what Merlin we have in by default. And then a rear vision mirror because I always roll with a mirror on the Spitfire. Interestingly enough, we don't appear to have any sort of real micromanagement over the belt contents. So I'm just stuck with whatever the defaults are. We'll cut the fuel back a little, make it about 80%. Put a couple paint schemes. Um, we are flying a Soviet Lindley Spitfire. I might go with this one. So let's go. Now, there's a couple things I've noticed right off the bat, and before I unpause, I'll get into them. Um, one of them is that the controls feel very much more like old IL-2, or like an older sort of semi-arcade sim, say um, the original IL-2 series, or Strike Fighters 2, or something like that, where um, you don't so much have the feel of the aircraft, um, it won't, it, maybe it's just because the, the weather's calm, maybe if I add some turbulence it'll be different, but for now the Spitfire seems to go exactly where it's pointed, I can fly hands off comfortably without having to really even worry about trim, um, it just doesn't seem quite as much of a handful as Cliffs of Dover and certainly not DCS, and I'll come back to that later because I do have some more things I want to say on that. The other thing is the track IR profile, which is interesting. Now, there's a separate um, zoom in and zoom out function, as there is in IL-2, Cliffs of Dover, and also in DCS. But, um, well, I will say, in Cliffs of Dover, it's just a fixed uh, three position by changing your field of view. So you have delete, which is your zoomed right in view. Then you have, actually it might be four. Then you've got um, end, which is kind of your normal view, and page down is your zoomed out view. I think there might be one for home as well, but I can't remember. Um, for DCS and for this, it's a gradual zoom. Um, in DCS, you can map it to an axis. In this, I've got it mapped to one of the thumb hats on my joystick, just because I don't think it's able to be mapped to an axis in this. Um, it could be, I might try it later. The other way you can modify that is with the scroll wheel on the mouse. But here's the interesting thing. You can move your head position around the cockpit like you can with DCS. Um, the interesting thing though is that I have almost no forwards or backwards movement. I can barely lean in or out, which is really annoying. Like, I don't remember if that was an issue in Rise of Flight, but in Rise of Flight the aircraft cockpits were very small and very cramped, and your gun, like your face was right up in your gun sight or your windscreen anyway. In this, I want to be able to lean in to get a clearer view of what's off the nose. If I'm chasing someone, I want to be able to lean right in, but I don't seem able to do it. I have to actually use the zoom function, which I'd rather not have to do. So that's a bit of a pain. Um, I haven't changed my track IR profile at all. I'm using the same one I've been using for 11 years now. Um, 
So it's not that, it's just it handles the track IR input and it has different track IR limits than any of the other sims I'm used to. IL-2-1946, you could physically lean forward in the cockpit. Um, Cliffs of Dover, you can do it. War Thunder, you can do it. And obviously Birds of Prey, where War Thunder was originally um, taken from. DCS, you can do it. This, you can't, or at least not in any way I found. I don't want to have to change my track IR profile or make a new one for this game. So I'm not sure how I'm going to get around that or if I can even get around it, but uh, it is a pain. A few of the controls as well are a bit iffy. Um, you don't really have as many options when it comes to mapping things. Um, things like curves and stuff are in some ways more intuitive for certain things, uh, like for the pitch and roll axes, you get a decent amount of control on them, but for say the throttle axes, there's not a lot. Um, suffice to say, Binding controls in DCS while a pain is actually a much better process. It gives you a lot more control over the aircraft. And that touches on fidelity of the uh, the cockpits, which I'll come back to again later. Let's just jump into it here and you'll be able to see what I mean, probably. We're up against a trio of 109s. Right, it's a little low. I turn the shadows on this one.
out of armor. down a bit. So yeah, I mean, Rise of Flight really made me feel like I was flying a World War One aircraft. This, I don't know, Cliffs of Dover definitely feels closer to what I'd expect a Spitfire to fly like, so does DCS to an extent. Um, you know, in certain areas DCS feels slightly exaggerated perhaps, but it's probably not. I mean, DCS is probably the most accurate, given that uh, the flight model and that was based off the old flying machine company's Mark 9. But yeah, like, this just doesn't quite feel like what I'd expect. I'm not having to work the trim as much as I do in either of the other games. Now we are in a Mark V, so we ran out of cannon ammo very quickly. We also have machine gun. One of the things that I was mentioning before, the lack of forwards and backwards track arm movement, watch this. See how little zoom I get, or how little movement I get off that? So if I want to lean in to see something, I can't do it. I have to use the zoom, which kind of defeats the purpose, because a lot of the time when I'm leaning forwards, I'm trying to see around something. I guess if I... No, can't do it. Ducking down, still can't do it. So you only have like an inch or two of forward travel in the track IR, which is not great, um, not optimal. So you can stick your head out of the canopy in this, like the Sodova, but unlike the Sodova, there's no tail structure to be seen. Even DCS is more detailed.
just going to pause here. Um, so the damage model is the old fashioned, just change the texture of the damaged part, um, kind of like DCS. And the original IL-2 games, as you can see, I'm just peppered with holes, but they're not locational like they are in Cliffs of Dover. The shattered canopy is a nice little touch. But yeah, it's uh, the damage model is certainly not as detailed as Cliffs of Dover's. Uh, the flight model doesn't feel quite as detailed either. Graphically, the game's very similar to Rise of Flight. Um, it's hard to explain. It's not unrealistic or cartoony, but it does feel kind of stylized, if that makes sense. I don't know what it is about the engine they used for Rise of Flight, but just something about it makes the terrain in particular not quite feel... It's, it's kind of in the Uncanny Valley, right? So the terrain in DCS 2.5 is pretty realistic. The terrain in Cliffs of Dover is pretty realistic. This is pretty realistic, but it's just kind of stylistic enough that it doesn't quite feel right for me, I guess. It's hard to explain. Um, the aircraft itself, I mean, it's relatively detailed. I don't have 4K textures enabled because I don't think my PC could handle it. Um, well, it could probably handle it, just not with a very high frame rate. Um, I mean, it's not like they're not detailed textures or that they look bad, they look fine. Um, just there's not, I guess, as much material definition as there is in Cliffs of Dover um, for the interior or DCS for the exterior. So the interior cockpit in this, I would say, to an extent, is probably a bit better than DCS. Um, and the exterior, I'd say, is the opposite. I'm going to go ahead and unpause. I'm going to see if I can find somewhere to land, hopefully without getting shot up again. So as you can see, there's actually some shadow down in the footwell, unlike DCS, which is a nice touch. Okay, there's quite a lot of detail in this cockpit, honestly. Like, it's not a badly done cockpit. Guys, still tailing me. Get rid of the hub. I do like the way the reflective gun side in this actually fades based on where your head is. It feels like an actual reflective gun side. Um, in DCS, it's just uh, like a solid ring. Um, this is Dover as well, but particularly in DCS, a lot of the hot elements and gun sights feel too clean, if that makes sense. Like they're drawn on rather than, or they're being rendered directly onto a screen rather than reflected off a combiner glass. Now here's something, I can't seem to close my canopy again. There we go. You have to be below a certain speed to open or close, apparently. Oop, ow, ow, ow. And my tail controls are gone. So, as you can see, the damage on the pilot is actually pretty impressive, much like Rise of Flight. Um, it's better than just the red screen of Cliffs of Dover or immediately, you know, all or nothing kind of damage like DCS has. And the aircraft comes apart, and as it comes apart, you know, it's it's affected by physics. Um, much like Rise of Flight, it was always very impressive to watch aircraft smash into the ground. Whoop. Okay, we got kicked back to the, to the menu here. So yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how I feel about this. It... It seems like it's a decent game. I mean, I could see the fun of playing this in multiplayer, much like it was fun to play Rise of Flight, but at the same time, it maybe I've been spoiled by, you know, um, Cliffs of Dover's clickable cockpits and DCS full fidelity aircraft, but 
having the lack of clickable functions in the cockpit, so I have to bind everything and then remember what those binds are. And also um, just some of the some of the ways in which the aircraft handle some of the feel of the the game. I don't know, it, it feels more like one of those old-fashioned kind of semi-sims, like, for instance, IL-246 for its day it was a really good simulator, but in hindsight it was, you know, relatively arcadey, and in a similar fashion you've got things like Strike Fighters for Jets, and those were great games in their time, and a lot of people enjoyed playing them. I enjoyed playing them. Um, but I feel like it kind of caters to a, a an audience that I'm not really as much of a part of anymore. Um, Having the clickable pits has spoiled me. I like to have that extra level of control over my aircraft. I like not having to remember key binds, but having to remember where something's located in the cockpit to use it. Um, and I, I kind of prefer that now to the point where it's difficult to come back from that to just a, you know, a, um, pure HOTAS setup. Now, with Rise of Flight, that wasn't a problem, because in a World War I plane, there's nothing to bind. You know, there's there's maybe two or three switches in the entire cockpit, right? So there's there's nothing really there. But in these World War II birds, as the aircraft start getting more complex, I feel like going the route of the full fidelity clickable cockpit is probably more what I'm, I'm inclined to do these days. Now, with that said, um, DCS is missing a lot of features that this game has. Things like, for instance, um, being able to add or remove parts to the aircraft before you fly, um, like the mirror and changing the engine and so on. Um, DCS could probably use something like that, but I don't think we'll ever see it. Uh, it I guess you could do that by kind of a workaround with the loadout screen, perhaps if you made the um, made the mirror into a pylon of sorts, kind of like the MiG Twenty One's um, countermeasure pods and the Harrier's gun pods and things like that. You know, utility pods that attach to the aircraft um, and remain attached to it, aren't jettisonable or, or weapons themselves. Um, so I guess you could kind of do that in DCS. So I like that feature. Um, certain aspects of this, like the gun sight for instance, the, the reticle on the gun sight just adds that little bit of extra immersion that you don't really get in DCS. Um, it just feels more right, especially having seen these gun sights used um, and, and seen what they look like um, when they're actually in action. This is more in line with what I'd expect. Um, there's no annoying baked on reflections on the cockpit. Uh, there's a lot of baked on scratches, but I mean, that at least makes sense and you can tell what's a scratch and what's not. The, the baked on reflections in DCS are really annoying. Cliffs of Dover doesn't have either, so that's not really an issue. Um, the lack of forwards and backwards movement on the track IR I find really annoying. So that's a bit of an issue too. I, I don't know, I'm on the fence. Now, with that said, um, they are kind of doing a remake, I guess, of Rise of Flight in this engine uh, with the Rise of Flight aircraft, which I do have. Um, so there's that. I'll probably get back into that. But I don't know if I'll play this as much as I play DCS or as much as I play Cliffs of Dover, to be fair. Um, the multiplayer in this is certainly going to be more active. I don't know if anyone plays Cliffs of Dover at all anymore. And, um, you know, DCS World War II is pretty pretty neglected, unfortunately. So I guess if I want to do World War II uh, multiplayer flight simming, this is probably going to be really the only outlet for it. But at the same time, I'm, I'm kind of lukewarm on it. I'm not as into it as I thought I'd be. And that might change with time. I might, you know, it might just take me a couple of hours to warm up to it. But it just doesn't quite feel there. At least from flying the Spitfire, which is the aircraft I'm most familiar with. Um, it might be different for some of the other aircraft. Now, with that said, um, the campaigns and so on in this are probably better than the ones in 
Cliffs of Dover just by virtue of the AI not being completely broken. And they will certainly be better than in DCS because DCS is really sorely lacking in, uh, in sort of dynamic campaigns. The other thing which I haven't had a chance to try yet is the ground side of things. Now from watching videos of the ground side of things, it actually does look very impressive um, to the point where I'm not sure there's anything out there which can rival it for World War II tanks. So that might actually be where I end up spending most of my time in this series, which is bizarre. It's certainly not what I would have expected, but that might be the case. So we'll try that flight again, and I'll see if I can actually not waste all my ammo on a single 109 this time. Um, and then afterwards I might try something a bit different. I might try another aircraft or something. I am pretty fucking sleepy. I just hit a wall, like, right after I went live. So uh, I might just do a quick bit of testing in this, and then I might take a nap or something, and then I might stream uh, again later and actually go on multiplayer or something like that. I don't know where it's come from, I'm just all of a sudden very tired. It's ambushed me. Let's make sure we still got everything on the aircraft we want. Yep, we still got our mirrors and everything. Convergence set to 200. It defaulted at like 600 meters, which is just obscene. You'll notice as well on this, the um, canvas covers over the gun ports are already blown, which is interesting. some settings to adjust to my uh, frame rate's a little low. You also notice some very, very obvious exhaust trails in this. Which I'm not sure how I feel about. There you go. Aircraft spotting is certainly, certainly not as good, I would say, as Cliffs of Dover. You could probably make an argument that it's as bad as DCS, if not worse. Something else to note is uh, I'm rolling with a one-to-one -one curve here, same as in Cliffs of Dover, and it feels much more twitchy in this, much, much more twitchy, which is interesting. Oh, there's my body over there. Yeah, I'd say the spotting is actually worse than DCS, that's quite bad. Quite bad. I'll also note, uh, based on my criticisms on the flight model, I am playing on full realism. The only realism setting I have unchecked is the uh, disallow external views. So everything else is full realism. Flight models, damage models, everything. That, I think, is my wingman in front of me. 
Yes, it is. Got to open my radiator, which you have to do manually. It doesn't have it open at mission start, so I just boiled off a good portion of my water there. There's always a good way of spotting new players in Rise of Flight. There's a great big white trail behind them. Okay, we're out of cannon again. hit. Tail looks okay for now. AI is not fantastic. Um, it's very much like Rise of Flight's AI. So where DCS AI goes into endless vertical loops when you get behind them, Rise of Flight AI goes into endless horizontal turns, like endless flat turns. And the uh, AI in this seems to do very much the same thing. Probably getting quite low on gun ammo, so I don't know if I'll be able to get this guy. Now I should note, my oil temperature is pegged against the stop, yet my engine is still running fine. I do have all the realism options turned on as I said, so it seems like unduly hard to actually damage your engine in this. I will double check, but I'm sure I've got engine damage turned on. Trace is a hot garbage, you can't see anything. So, one of the big problems with not being able to lean forwards is that it actually makes it ridiculously difficult to see different instruments. For instance, I cannot get a good view of my compass. I have to kind of do this, whereas in DCS or Cliffs of Dota, I can physically lean over or around the stick. Um, not so here. Uh-oh. Looks like he's pulling in to chase me. He is. Trying out running. It's 
mirror's not great, it's kind of angled upwards, so I have to lean at a specific angle to see in over my tail. Um, whereas the DCS one points directly backwards, this is kind of tilted up to look over my tail. I don't like it. There's an airfield there, but this guy is still sitting right behind me, I think. There he is. No idea how much fuel I've got, because uh, I can't click the button to get a fuel reading, and I don't know what the binding is for it. So we're just going to have to hope for the best. Likewise, I don't think there's a way to turn the gun side off. I'm not even sure there's a dimmer switch for it, to be honest. I know there's a, uh, like a dimmer plate anti-glare plate, but I don't know about a switch to actually give the gun side. So the plate is not that. What is it? Not that either. Uh, it's fine. Ignore that. That's interesting. I don't know why that dropped the gear, that was the, uh, oh, maybe that was the emergency gear button I accidentally hit. So we're, we're finding out the key bindings as we go. The spit in this seems to actually show little to no um, nose down moment, nose down pitch, when you deploy the flaps, as opposed to DCS and Cliffs of Dover, which I find interesting again. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to feel about this, I really don't. Here's a question. Can we see the prop pitch in action? Possibly not with the engine off. Doesn't look like it. We do have the little flap indicators, like in uh, DCS and Cliffs of Dover. I think the landing gear indicators work too, uh, although I obviously can't put the wheels down now to check. We got flares up under the seat there because like in Rise of Flight you can actually uh, pull out your flare pistol and yeet. We'll pull out a handgun too I believe. Okay maybe not. Just a flare pistol I guess. Hang on, do that again. It does actually take the flare, the cartridge, from in front of the seat, which is neat. Hmm. 
I guess there's that. Okay, let's finish that mission. We'll try flying something else. Yeah, I'm, I'm really conflicted on this. Like, the flying doesn't really feel like it's quite what I'm used to anymore. Oops, that's the wrong button. We'll try flying. Uh, we'll, we'll go somewhere else. We'll go over Stalingrad itself. No, I assume I have access to all these aircraft, but I don't know for sure. Go to the Yak 1. So here's our realism. It is the same as, well, expert, I guess. It's the same as that except for all our spectators, so there's no simplifications, no pilot assistance, and there's none of the gameplay assistance stuff. It is purely, um, it, it's set to full realism. So we'll try out the Yak-1 and uh, see how that flies, and then after that, I might just quickly see if I can hop in one of the tanks, maybe, and drive that around. I'm not even sure what the controls are for that, I haven't bound them up, but we'll figure something out. Hey, Gnex! Just gonna do a short stream here. Uh, I was planning on doing a long one, but I'm really tired all of a sudden, so I'm gonna do a quick kind of first look at this, and then hop off, have a nap, come back, and uh, probably do some Cliffs of Dover, I guess. And maybe do some multiplayer in this. I don't know. I feel like, um... I feel like Cliffs of Dover is going to be my go-to World War II sim. Um, at least until DCS is working. Okay. What modifications can we even put in this thing? Ah, weaponry. Terror of the Fascists, M.D. Baranov. That's what that says. I think this one's more to the point. We'll roll with this. Start learning the P-51 and combined arms. Um, yeah, I mean, I still haven't done anything with the P-51. Spitfire is more my jam. The P-51 involves knowing how to boom and zoom and not getting pulled into turn fights, which I'm crap at. Oh, this head position. See what I mean about the AI? They just... They just flat turn, it's all they do. It's like a horizontal version of the DCS AI. Cliffs of Dover's AI is so much better at dogfighting. I mean, these guys are better at landing, but... Definitely not at fighting. We should have gone for him.
I just kill this pilot? Yep. He toast. Ooh, Jesus. Try that again. Yeah, I don't know, just something about the flying doesn't quite feel right. I do like the gun sights. The fact that it fades based on where your head is, that is so much better than DCS. The fact that DCS still looks like it's rendering onto a screen, rather than light reflecting onto a combiner glass, it shouldn't. It really shouldn't look like that. Um, it's just a little detail, but it's a little detail that makes a lot of difference. Oh, 100% fuel, let's do something about that. Lighten the plane up a bit. Gunsight glass on this thing is damn son. Those others are probably gonna turn in on me. I can't see them and I don't like that. Something else about this, kind of like Rise of Flight, the uh, color balance is kind of weird. The contrast in this is actually really washed out. I need to fix that. There it, is. it makes it even harder to see aircraft. Yeah, so we've actually found the one game with worse spotting than DCS. I'm impressed. Overheating. I have no idea how to uh, actually let's check that real quick. How do I mess with the radiator on this thing? Key mapping, plane engine controls, radiator, water radiator shutters, control axis. Let's change that. Um, I can 
actually leaned forwards a little more in this than in the Spitfire. Still not great, but it's better than, than in that. Almost lost in there. Almost. And this is where Cliffs of Dover's glints off cockpits and wings would have come in real handy. Of course, I'm in a Yak 1, so I can easily pull inside this turning circle. I'll catch up on chat in a minute. I'm just trying to concentrate here. The AI in this really are pretty easy to kill. Much like DCS, sadly. Now see, if I slow down enough, I can induce a stall, or a spin, but I have to slow right down to do it. Oop, down he goes. It's not like in Cliffs of Dover, or especially DCS, where if you maneuver too violently, even at high speed, you uh, are at risk of spinning yourself. I think I just killed my engine. I did indeed just kill my engine. Okay, so it turns out you can overheat it. It just takes a long time, because I wasn't able to do that in a Spitfire, despite running the Merlin at full power for about 10 minutes. Ooh, down we go. Splat. Like the train, but something about it feels... That's exactly what I was saying. Something... Because it, it, this is based on... Uh, you know, this is like a, a modernized version of Rise of Flight. Something about Rise of Flight, graphically, never quite felt right. It's a very pretty game, but just something about it was a bit uncanny. And this has the same problem. Now, one other thing... Oops, not that. One other thing I will say is, um, options-wise, you don't have a lot. Both in control binding and just general game settings, it's really lacking. Really, really lacking, which I'm not a fan of. Excuse me. Um, gamma correction. Oh, maybe that's what I want. Is that... That's probably not going to help. Because the gamma isn't the issue, it's the fucking contrast. There's no contrast. Everything's really bright and there's no contrast whatsoever. Now we're going to also... Shadows, shadows, shadows. High. I have to restart the game to get that to take effect, but I'll do that another time. Um, see, I can't set the contrast in game, brightness or contrast. Only the um, the gamma sharpen. No, it runs like shit. 
because it's a it's just an overlay filter and it it makes it run really badly for me. Like the sharpen filter actually helps in this game. It's one of few games where it's useful. It doesn't make the game look worse and make it harder to see things. Like for instance, in Tarkov, I hate the sharpen filter. In Armor Three, I turned it off immediately. In this, it's actually better because you can see things. It adds that little bit of contrast that the game lacks by default. Oh, the other thing um, which bamboozled me is there's only a master volume control and a checkbox for the title music. You cannot turn the engine sound, the, the radio sound, the, the music sounds. You can't control volume on them independently. It's only a master volume. Why? Like, from what I remember, Rise of Flight was pretty simple in the options it gave you as well, but I seem to recall it's still giving you more customization of the game than uh, this does. Armor 3 suffers from weird ass outline over everything, Sharpen just makes it worse. Uh, to be fair, with Sharpen turned all the way down, I don't notice that outline anymore. Um, well, also, you've got to tweak with the anti-aliasing, because some of it comes from that too, I think, like the um, foliage anti-aliasing. Okay. Let's see. Um, we'll see if... Uh, See, I haven't bound up any controls for this, so I have no idea how this is going to work. What does this do? Ah! Oh, you can change the settings here. Okay. So we'll go with, say, 85 cent fuel. Uh, buh, buh, buh. AP, APHE. Um, APCR and that. As if you would ever carry that much APCR. Winter camo in the middle of summer, let's go. <laughs> let's do this. Okay, so the realism options for the ground vehicles are the same as the air vehicles, I guess. No regular AP? No, there is regular AP, I just didn't bother taking it, because the AP HE will have more effect if it hits something, well, if it penetrates something. Looks animated like a Studio Ghibli film? Yeah, that's kind of the impression I got too. Like, Rise of Flight felt kind of painterly. It felt... Uh, so say naval action, for instance, at times feels like an oil painting, like a Turner painting of a naval battle or something. This is like the aerial equivalent, I find. Um, it doesn't look bad or necessarily unrealistic. It looks kind of impressionistic, which I'm not sure how I feel about. I think that works a lot better with other games than uh, something which is kind of supposed to be a simulator. So, since you guys all turned up late, um, just a quick rundown of what I've discovered so far. Okay, so there's things I do like, like the gun sight, I like how that works. The sounds are pretty good. Uh, the physics, when you actually do crash, the plane breaks up and bits slide along the ground and cartwheel and all that, that's cool, I like that. Um, things I don't like so much, the, um, the fact that everything is kind of low contrast and blown out lighting, so it's really hard to spot things. The spotting itself is quite bad. Um, the head movement with track IR is extremely limited, especially in the Spitfire. I have no forwards and backwards movement. I have like an inch, basically. So if I want to lean forwards and look around the stick or look under the gun sight, I can't do it. Like, I physically cannot do it. And that's something I rely on very heavily um, in other sims. Um, the damage model itself is quite simplistic, like, say, old IL-2 or like DCS. Um, the engine damage model seems simplified. I was running the Spitfire's Merlin to within an inch of its life and it was having no adverse effects on it that I could see. Um, the actual flight feels... Uh, it feels like the original IL-2. Um, you know, where the aircraft feels not like an aircraft. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't feel like a, um, it's hard to explain. 
So as someone who flies, the aircraft has a specific feel to it. It's not just you can point it in whatever, even in perfectly calm weather, you can't just point it wherever you want and totally hands off and it'll look after itself. You can do that to an extent, but you know, you have to set your trim up, you have to make sure everything's all right, you have to check everything, and if a gust of wind hits it, it knocks it off totally. This doesn't feel like that. This feels like I can point the aircraft in a direction, take my hands off the controls, and it will keep going that way forever. Um, kind of like the older Sims, like the original IL-2 series, like Strike Fighters 2, where the aircraft flight modeling is really heavily scripted and it's not physics based. Which is bizarre because coming from Rise of Flight, I know very well that Rise of Flight was physics based because you could get your wing rigging tangled up on someone else and, and go into a like a pirouette of death attached at the wing. Um, so it feels like a step backward in that, which is weird. How's the local public transportation doing? Um, is there a meme there I'm missing? I don't know. Um, but local public transportation here is a joke because I live in the country. Okay. Uh, this is, we're not actually fighting tanks here, I guess. We're just shooting ground targets. Okay. I have no idea what I'm doing. So my stick doesn't work. Does WASD do anything? Do I have to turn the Oh yeah, I have to turn the engine on first. Oh. All right. How do I... Okay, so it's arrow keys. This is going to be really awkward since my phone is sitting right next to the arrow keys. Let's see if I can go to the gunner seat, um, if I can remember how to do it. Aha! Oh god. Oh god. Why am I looking down? There we go. That's my coax. How do I set... That's the engine. How do I set my gun elevation? I have no idea. Interesting that the water ricochets every round that hits it. I should probably actually look up some of the controls here. Okay, tank controls. We've got that. Left control C, left shift C. Right shift C. Uh, range adjustment? Yeah, I probably should have looked at that, hey. What a bizarre... There we go. That's still awkward, but it's better than nothing. No. 
It's not doing it. It hasn't... I can't do it. It's not range adjusting. No, I know I need... Well, technically I don't. I can Kentucky windage it. Which I always used to do in uh, Red Orchestra and stuff. But what I really need is to figure out why it's not working even though I just found it. Oh, it didn't save. That would be why. Accept. Accept. There we go. Hey, there we go. Wow, that was a pretty good guess. AP, I think. I'm not entirely sure. Oops, don't want to do that. Okay. Select ammunition, right alt G, left alt R. Right alt G. It's uh, times a hundred, that's 800 meters. Why am I not reloading? Bruh. Why am I not reloading? What's going on here? Now I can't even find my coax. Oh, okay. I'm... wait, no. I see. I think. I have no idea why that's not reloading, though. Oh, I see a tank. Oh, no. No. And now I can't get the gun sight to... there we go. Now it's working. Oof! That was an HE round. Bit long. Over. The inertia on the turret is a little weird to get used to. Also, they stop immediately when they're damaged, which is really bizarre. I know, I feel like the physics in this are kind of... ...not what I expected. Especially coming from Rise of Flight, which was very much physics-based. Ooh, direct hit.
That was a good guess. Now we're on an angle here, so this is probably going to miss. About to about 16. Short. Uh, 22, we'll call it. Close enough. I don't know if there's a way to look around the turret though. Like from this position. What was it? Change positions again? Uh, key mapping. Right control C. Now we're the driver. Now we're back to the. You can't be the loader, I guess. Or the hull gunner, which is interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's going to take some getting used to, but I could see this working pretty well. the uh, pontoon bridge on. Alright, let's catch up. On chat. Did it have APCR, but I don't think it was used very much. No, it wasn't. They didn't have a lot of it. APCR was usually, um, it usually incorporated more important strategic metals, and so aside from the fact they didn't make very much of it, it was also perpetually in short supply. Um, it's so. Here's the thing. APCR is very effective at getting through armor, but the terminal effect's not as good because it's a smaller... Essentially, the shell itself is just a vessel to get the penetrating rod there, and so you've got a smaller, lighter mass getting pushed through the armor. It's going to make a smaller hole, it's going to fragment less, and it's going to cause less damage inside the tank. It's kind of like the problem with anti-tank rifles, where they could go in one outside... And, oh, sorry, in one side and out the other without actually damaging the interior, um, interior of the tank or knocking out crew members or whatever. So that's the issue with APCR. War Thunder exaggerates it though, like War Thunder's damage model is fucked, especially in arcade. Um, APHE, which is what I had loaded for my AP round in this, is good, because if it gets through the plate, that's, you know, if it gets through, it will then explode inside and just skull fuck everything. Uh, that's why in War Thunder the German and Soviet tanks tend to one-shot people, because they usually fire APHE. Um, and then HE is usually, in like a historic World War II scenario, HE is going to be your primary load, because guess what you're doing? You are supporting infantry. Um, you might not be supporting infantry in the sense that you are a slow tank and they're all running directly behind you, but a lot of your work as a tank will be knocking out either um, you know, strong points in buildings or trench lines, um, knocking out anti-tank guns to protect yourself and other tanks, tank destroyers, uh, light skin vehicles, like tank on tank combat wasn't all that common, and people have this idea that tanks are made to kill other tanks, like no, they're not, and especially not during the Second World War, that, that was not the case and it generally didn't happen. Um, people don't kind of get the they can't picture the bigger picture, right? 
they think of things in terms of game maps where you have one armored unit and another armored unit and they just do this. They don't actually picture that those two armored units might not be in the same area of the front. They might briefly see each other. They might not even see each other at all. Like, that's not how war works, right? You can't just magically make your armored unit hit their armored unit and have a tank on tank fight. It, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. When it does, it's typically by accident, um, or it's as part of a combined arms push where the tanks are still fighting other things. They just happen to also be fighting tanks. Like, even at Prokhorovka, which is the single biggest tank engagement to ever happen, um, it wasn't purely tank on tank. There were aircraft involved, there were a lot of anti-tank guns, infantry, everything. People just kind of magically um, memory hold the fact that there was anything there other than tanks. Also, in a real battlefield, especially one of that scale, there is so much smoke and noise, and you're in a tank anyway, so you cannot see shit that's going on outside at the best of times good luck spotting the other tanks to engage them. Like, people really don't understand how chaotic and confusing a battlefield is. They just have these weird and wonderful ideas stoked by top 10 documentaries on the post-90s history channel. It, it just, uh, it pisses me off because it's, people get such a wrong idea about World War II history and then have very strong opinions about it and never actually think to read up on it. They love combo rounds. Russia and Germany pioneered semi arm piercing incendiary bullets. Yeah, yeah, the Germans and the Soviets love their, their fancy ammo. Meme as you went from tank to planes unprompted and nearly went into a micro rant about flight models. <laughs> I mean, it's because you guys turned up late. You should have been here earlier and you would have seen me kind of like, oh, this feels weird as I flew. Just like when me and Jeff talked about commutes. Oh, I see. Yeah, I get it now. I get it now. It's just done by a BDC. Yeah, the sights on all of these Second World War tanks are BDCs. Um, I'm not going to hop in the Panzer three now because I can't be bothered to load it back up, but that's a BDC as well. But it's a, like, it's a sliding BDC, so in this, obviously, as you saw, the, whoops, the BDC actually moves up and down, yeah? The uh, Soviet tanks used a simple sliding crosshair, the Allies were straight BDC with no moving side elements on, like, basically all their vehicles. Um, the Germans used an outer ring, which was your range scale, so you had two moving elements on the German sites instead of one on the Soviet. Um, on the German sites you would have the outer ring which rotates around as you change the range setting on the site, and then the other moving element was the actual reticle which was a like a sort of post style with a chevron on top. I mean, the chances of hitting something even at 5,000 metres is pretty slim with that thing. But indirect fire artillery style? Yeah, the Soviets did that a lot with their tanks. Um, a lot of their armoured vehicles had um, the necessary uh, mechanical computers for being used in indirect fire. The self-propelled guns, like the SU-152 especially, um, were used quite heavily in that role. Um, even, I believe, right into the Cold War, I'm pretty sure some of the Soviet MBTs could still technically be used as, um, as artillery. Technically. It wasn't a good use of them, but if it was needed, it could be done. But yeah, at 5,000 metres, you're not going to hit anything. Even with a 1970s, or even with a modern tank at 5,000 metres, unless you have an, a barrel-launched ATGM, uh, like, say, a T-72 or something, you're not hitting something. Um, you're just not basically. It's there for very optimistic uh, shots, shall we say. Also, you've got the two range scales. So on this, the left side is for my um, armor piercing rounds, and then the right side is for my... The far right one is my coaxial machine gun, and then the sort of second from the right scale, I believe, is for my high explosive shells.
Yeah, volley sights were a thing in World War One, and then everyone realised they were stupid and got rid of them. ATGM ain't gonna hit more than 3k out, best case even with today's crap. Yeah, um, neither's your gun though, so. I don't think it was 6,000 meters for the Charlie, I think it was... How far was it? It was like... I think it was about... 4? Or 5? I know it was a very long shot. But I don't think it was six. Maybe it was. Maybe I'm wrong. But that's still a very optimistic shot with, you know, pretty much modern fire control um, on, I believe, a stationary target. Dual stage hash, hash round? Yeah, that would certainly be interesting. Alright, we're going to jump out of the tank. I need to... Okay, so the other thing is, as well... Um, I'm sure there's a way to pop out of the gun sight in this. Let me just have a look. That's the wrong button. This is the right button. I have no idea what I'm doing. There has to be some way of doing it. Right shift. No? Okay, I guess not. Maybe not in the T-34, maybe only in the Sherman and the uh, Panzer III. We'll work that one out later. Spooling also does fuck all if your target has a good spool liner. No World War II tanks had a good spool liner. <laughs> Especially not German tanks, because they had very brittle, badly welded steel. Charlie 1 and Sabo at 4,700 meters. I know it was a Charlie 1, because it was in the first Gulf War, I think. Okay, let's do a bit more flying, I guess. Let's do over Stalingrad. Let's do an engagement in, let's see. P-39s, why not? Against, um, this three, and then we'll make this two 109s and three, so you got all the World War One planes from uh, Flying Circus. I might fly them in a bit. Pine calls. Hmm. No Dornier 17s, which is interesting. I mean, did the Germans not use Dornier 17s on the Eastern Front or something? I have no idea. I would have thought they would. with JU-88s. I mean, that's what they were known for, but, I mean, I, I can't imagine that being their only use. I'm sure they would have seen some service on the Eastern Front. May have been no, they used them right through the, well, maybe not right through the war, but for a large part of it. 
um, not just the 17, but the 215, the 217, the 317, I think it was, was there a 317? Whatever. Um, they had enough variants that they were in service for a very long time, put it that way. Two hundred meter convergence because six hundred meters. The default is absolutely dumb as fuck. Interestingly, it's showing for extra ammo, which adds weight, no speed loss. Go down to about eighty percent fuel. Oh, my lucky number. We'll go with this. Appear to be leaking. Probably shouldn't have sat behind those bombers. This thing's controls are so sensitive. It's so twitchy. So so twitchy. And there goes the engine. I definitely need curves in this game. Everything is so sensitive. Oh look, gun actually recoils. That's cute. Loop. Actually, open the the cockpit on this. I don't think you can. Oh, there we go. You can jettison it. I don't know if you can open it. Hello. Hello. Won't let me out. Try again. Man, this thing twitches like crazy. my wing already full of holes.
I was gonna get a nap, but I'm actually kind of awake now, so... I might play this for a little bit longer and then switch back to Pussy Dover. I don't know, I think this is gonna take some getting used to. I kind of feel like Pussy Dover is the better sim in a lot of ways, but this is really where I'm gonna get multiplayer action because I don't even know if anyone still plays Pussy Dover. Whereas I know people play this. Gunners in this are insane. Well, he's going down, finally. Exhaust effects in this are really nice, far better than both DCS and Cliffs of Dover. The, uh, the leaks and trails and smoke and stuff, not so much. Guy's about to have a bad day. Finish that mission. So let's take some of the World War One planes out for a spin. See how they handle. I am curious. Probably it's going to be very much like Rise of Flight since this game is built off of it, um, and that might actually that will probably feel better to me because I'm used to Rise of Flight. Take up our Albi, favorite World War One plane. Uh, we'll make this full. Not camels. Um, we'll make it four SE fives. That 
Aha, here we go. We get a collimator. Some gauges. The overwing Lewis is a trap, by the way. It's basically useless. Well, I say that. It's not bad if you're attacking bombers because you can roll up underneath them, but... It's not ideal. Oh, what? I already clicked right there. Need a nap. Yeah, well, see, I might as well take one, to be honest. Let's do another flight or two in this, and then I'll uh, head off for a bit, and I'll come back and do some Cliffs of Dover later, I guess. Might see about um, maybe a campaign or something in that. I don't know how well it'll work, because we know the AI is not very bright, but we'll try it. Here we go. This is what I'm used to. Ones were already popped. Hang on. How do 
fly. Um, no, settings. Key mapping, weapons controls. Reload all guns, left alt R, oh, right, okay. Or middle mouse. There we go. It's an albatross in front of me. See, this feels like what the game was made for. See what I mean about the AI though, they just flat turn, that's all they do. Same as Rise of Flight, that's all they did there as well. Whoop, whoop, he's done. Smack. And see, it's with these old World War One planes that the game's flight modeling and its collision physics really shines. It feels much better like this than it did in the World War II aircraft. Much better.
that's an albatross there. So that must be an SE5 in front. Yeah, it is. Very low on ammo though, nearly empty. Pistol, unfortunately. I got a flare gun, but not a pistol. Let's do a quick fly around Stalingrad. Well, quick. In an albatross, it's not going to be all that quick. We'll do a bit of a fly around Stalingrad. May as well wind here. And just hope none of the SE5s come shoot me down. should be the Barricardi Gun Factory there, the nearer of those factories, and the further one should be the Red October Steelworks. Uh, which would make of that the Lazur Chemical Plan. And that is the tennis racket. It should be the tennis racket right about there, I think. I can never remember which is which. I think that's Barricadia and this is Lazur, but I might be wrong. The city is not actually that detailed by the looks of it, which is kind of sad. Railway station. Red Orchestra 2 players should recognise that. With the uh, footbridge over the top, the water tower, and the fountain. That's a fountain that's in Enemy of the Gates as well. Um, which is not a historically accurate portrayal of the Battle of Stalingrad, but that is in the film. Uh, that weird shaped kind of X building is the nail factory. That looks like it used to be a church. Um, and the Univermug Universal Store 
department store is on the far side of this, which is Fallen Fighters Square. A very simplified rendition of Fallen Fighters Square. That's the obelisk in the monument. That's the tech school behind me. where Pavlov's house is in reference to the River Mark. I think... I think it was north of it, so it should be along here somewhere. I'm looking for the old mill, because if I can find the mill, then I can find Pavlov's house. That's it there, I think. Yeah. Okay, so that fucked up brick structure off my 10 o'clock is the mill. That is Pavlov's house, the one on its left is Zabalotny's house, the little destroyed thing is representative of the chapel. Um, you can't see it because the ground textures are really shitty low res, but that kind of grey thing going under us across diagonally to the right is a tram line across 9th of January Square. The Voyantorg is uh, basically not present here, it's totally destroyed. There should be a row of houses along this side of the square, which were, you can't see me pointing, but right where my wing is now, which were German uh, reconnaissance, like scout positions. We're flying over the milk house now, where the troops in Pavlov's house attacked towards on the 25th of November, 1942. Yeah, yeah you are. But that is Pavlov's house, right there. I'm kind of disappointed how low detail the city is, like, it's really low detail. War Thunder has more detail than this, although War Thunder's not very accurate to the uh, historical layout. You are, of course, getting a tour of uh, downtown Stalingrad circa September, October 1942 in an Albatross D5, circa 1917, but, you know. I could actually go along and name uh, each, each sector of the city, I could name which Red Orchestra 1 or 2 map corresponds to that. So we're going south now, that big fuck-off structure right off my nose is the grain elevator. Oh, by the way, CJ, if you're interested, I have a composite of uh, Luftwaffe reconnaissance photos, which I put together. It's like a 40 megabyte image of the entire city, basically. Um, I've got two versions. i got one which is just composite of the photos. I've got one where I've drawn over it showing which Red Orchestra map corresponds to which area. Um, yeah, so that's the downtown area behind us. Now, the secondary railway station should be somewhere under us. And then this big boy right here is the grain elevator. Absolutely unmistakable. I gotta be careful I don't get too close to these artillery hits. They'll fold me in half. Right over the uh, southern suburbs of the city now. And a loop 
back around. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Imagine the amount of effort it would have taken to rebuild the place after the war. Just absolutely absurd. That's my engine tank. A little warm. I hope you can hear me over the engine, by the way. Because I am kind of partially deaf, I can't gauge volume very well. So I don't know which is louder, the game or me. Which is also why I tend to shout quite a lot, in case you've noticed. I just have no concept of how loud I am. Being a World War One aircraft, we have no trim here whatsoever, so this is actually a real effort to fly. Um, my hand's getting kind of sore. Yeah, the wind noise is the loudest, yeah. Just like Rise of Flight. Now this is the Tsaritsa Gorge here, I think. I'm pretty sure the Tsaritsa is the one that splits the city into north and south, so that's it there. It's not very deep in this. But like the elevation in general in this is kind of in, uh, like the terrain seems a bit too flat. Maybe not the riverbanks, but the gorges and so on. Jesus Christ, that was a bit hit. I'm gonna go see if I can spot Mamayev Kurgan and see if the uh, bunkers are there. So, again, that's uh, Fallen Fighter Square off my left with the Univermag, which is the Universal Department Store, on this side of the square where the artillery shell just hit. That's where Paul has signed the Sixth Army Surrender. Again, the fountain, the main railway station, and the nail factory right underneath us. So, the Mamai of Kurgan should be basically directly uh, west of us here. Actually, that might be it. I thought it was more or less in line with the railway station, but I could be wrong. My memory's not what it used to be. Yeah, no, we've got an airfield there, that's not it. I'd say this is probably it off the nose. Looks like it. Man, I really wish Red Orchestra 1 wasn't dead. Well, it's not. The Polish community still plays regularly, but... You know, Polish servers are like 450 ping for me. I wish that Red Orchestra 1 wasn't dead, and Red Orchestra 2 was actually as good as it should have been. Because Red Orchestra was and still is my favourite multiplayer game, and really one of my favourite games, period. I love that game. Yep, this is the Mamai of Kungan. That would be the big bunker on the hilltop or at least a representation of it, because as we've established, the ground isn't very detailed in this game. Yeah, there you go, big round bunker. I have some stories to tell about this map in RO2 when it first came out. That's where the, um, the Motherland Calls monument is today, right there. That's the tennis racket right there. So that's the Lazur Chemical Works right there next to the tennis racket. The thing off the nose is uh, the Barricadi Gun Factory. I think, I think this is the gun factory. Oh no, this is the tractor works, sorry, my bad. So that might be Chemical Works. That's the good, uh, is that? I can't remember. It's been a long time. It's like when I was playing Stalker, I 
remember vaguely where everything is, but it's been a long, long time. No, this is the gun factory, because I remember the way these uh, buildings are laid out next to the tanks on the other side. This is Commissar's house, part of it anyway. Like the admin building, the admin block of this factory is Commissar's house. Or is... no. No, I'm wrong, this is the tractor factory. I'm pretty sure. At my kind of peak of Stalingrad Spurging, I could identify the exact time and place a photo was taken based on the background. Um, there's a photo of a German infantry squad nestled up against a blown out factory building where we can see like generators and stuff in the hall behind it, uh, behind them. And based on the colour of it, because it's a colour photo, and the shape of the building and some distant buildings in the background, I figured out that it was taken in October and it was the back end of the tractor factory and I could identify the specific building it was in because I played so much of the tractor factory map in R01 and I actually went up and checked um, like using the Buddhist archive um, index for the photo I checked and I was right it was exactly the building I thought it was in fucking October 1942 I might post that uh, reconnaissance photo composite in the Discord once I'm done here. I keep vacillating between I'm going to keep flying or I'm going to go take a nap and fly later, but I might as well stay up, fuck it. My sleep cycle is such a mess already, it can't hurt any worse. That is the Red October Steelworks, I'm pretty sure, because I think it's, is there another factory up here, yes there, oh no, okay, this is Red October, my bad, because Red October was the furthest north of the factories from memory, I try and, like, I've got to try and picture the orientation of the map in my, in my mind, so I can figure out which building is which and then work out where I am. Or is this the tractor factory here? I think it goes... Okay, no. So it's Lazur, um, Barricade, Red October, which is behind me, and then the tractor factory here. We got there in the end. We worked it out eventually. Because I can remember the layout of the admin building, then the big yard, and then all these, these uh, warehouses behind it. Getting across from the workers' housing into the actual main uh, factory floor in the custom R01 map was a nightmare. It was such bad exposed ground. I really wish that I'd been able to stream back then, or at least record more videos of gameplay, because I love that game so much. Had insomnia last night, got about three hours of sleep. Yeah, I've been getting a couple of hours at a time for about a week now. It's really messed me up. And then if we go up here, we've got the, um, the sort of more rural suburbs. So the Spartanovka map in RO2 isn't actually based directly on any one of these. It's kind of a pastiche, as far as I can tell. So there is a suburb called Spartakovka, which I'm pretty sure is what they based it on. But it's not a one-to-one -one copy like some of the other maps are. And if you, like, if you've seen some of my other streams where I've got one two rants about Red Orchestra 2, I explain why I didn't like the maps in that so much. Um, even though the layouts were correct, the, the vertical element was missing, like, infantry will entrench wherever they're fighting. They're going to dig foxholes and communications trenches and 
hide in the rubble in that, and, and RO2's maps were very flat, um, and they were very much built around the game's cover system, which is a great way to get killed, to use the cover system. So, uh, I've ranted about that before, and you can kind of see the layout in this, but this is, it's almost like this is like, uh, RO2, in that everything's very flat, there's no trench works, and the, um, buildings are very, kind of, sparsely scattered around. Now, in real life, this was much less developed, um, instead of these workers' apartments, a lot of these were still the old-fashioned, uh, Isba, the, kind of, peasant log huts. And there was a big cathedral, or like a big uh, Orthodox church up here as well. Which does feature in the Spartanovka map in RO2. I do really need to brush back up on my geography. It's been a long time. Like, I used to be able to... I had such a photographic memory of this area that if you showed me a pic, like, any photo or any building, I could tell you exactly where it was. But, uh, it's been a few years, so... That knowledge has been kind of shunted out of my head and replaced with other things, like how to start up a Tomcat or a MiG-21. What I actually might do as well, I might post it in the Discord. I got bored one time when I was visiting my parents, um, and I started writing. I was writing kind of like a little, I guess a short story. It was from the perspective of a um, Soviet sniper that was actually fighting in the um, in the Red October Steelworks over the winter during the encir uh, encirclement. I might post that. It, I never finished it. It's like... I do a lot of writing that I just never finish. I go back and make little perfections to it, but I never actually do anything with it. So no one ever ends up seeing it. I might actually put it in there. So I kind of wrote that right around the height of when I was playing uh, Red Orchestra. I was very much in the mood, so to speak. So, from memory, the nearby airfield that's on the other side of Mamoy of Kurgan is Pitomnik. Uh, Gumrak is up there somewhere. There are a couple of other satellite fields too. From memory, I think Pitomnik was the last one the, Ger the uh, Germans lost, I think. And in a lot of cases, they were still taking off um, as the Soviet tanks rolled across onto the airfield. I know that happened at Gumrak. It's pretty hectic. Yeah, this is Red October Steelworks here, so if I can see how I start climbing. The Red Orchestra map. The uh, RO2 map based on the steelworks actually starts down this end from the workers' housing. I think that's the, um, what's that? That's the rolling shed, I think. So that's the first objective. So what I would do is I'd hold my team in spawn and call in a rocket strike on this to clear it and then force respawn everyone and rush it. And then this is the, uh, I'd, I'd basically hold them here until the um, artillery was ready again, and I'd just do the same thing. I'd work my way up the map doing that. This area is a lot more destroyed in Red Orchestra 2 than it is here. A lot more destroyed. And then this is the final objective up here. I think this is the uh, plate mill. This big shed right here. I think my favourite thing about flying the Albatross, other than the fact it's a beautiful aircraft, I mean, hang on, look at this thing. Real planes have curves. 
This is hands down the most beautiful World War One aircraft ever built. You cannot convince me otherwise. Look at it. Look at those lines. It might not be the fastest, it might not be the most maneuverable, but it's a good docile plane to fly, especially as far as World War One planes go. It it does everything well enough. It might not excel at everything, but it does everything well enough. And it just looks good. My favourite thing about flying it, other than admiring its beautiful shape, is just sitting here and watching the rocker arms on the top of the engine. I don't know if you can see that on the screen, but that combined with the sound of the wind, when I used to play Rise of Flight, I'd be at risk of falling asleep. It used to just lull me asleep as I was flying. Beautiful plane. The um, Austrian built ones didn't have the aerodynamic spinner on the prop, but they did have an aerodynamic cover over the um, the top of the engine, which is a bit bizarre because the Germans did the absolute opposite. They had an aerodynamic spinner, but the engine was left exposed. That's how you can tell where one was built. Um, there were other differences too. I think I think Johannesthal had a squared off rudder. Um, one of the factories had a squared off rudder. I think it was Johannesthal, or sorry, Johannesthal. I can't remember um, 100% though. So this here is the infamous tennis racket. An absolutely enormous rail marshal in the yard. I guess we must have shot down all of those SE5s since they're not harassing me now. Yeah, this looks like the chemical works here. Which was a custom map for Red Orchestra 1. So I might have had it backwards. It might be the chemical works here in the gun factory further down. I can't remember 100%. Like I said, it's been a while. Um, I do have it laid out on that. The um, composite of the recon photos. to floating about, around about this battle. Read up on it. Decisions were made on both sides were tenuous. We've gone horribly wrong for the Russians if Army Group A did their job and Hitler didn't sack all his commanders. Yeah. Yeah, it was certainly a hell of a high stakes battle. There's a lot of little known facts about it too that, you know, everyone kind of thinks of the enemy at the gates meme where only every second man has a rifle, and the Soviets are machine gunning their own troops. Um, interesting statistic, the vast majority of all men caught by the NKVD blocking detachments, except um, the workers' militia units generally did tend to break and, uh, and, and kind of retreat en masse when they hit a major German concentration. But the regular army units, generally the vast majority of men caught retreating from the front, wouldn't be shot, they'd just be held in reserve and then thrown in together with the next unit to go up to the front. You know, why would you waste your own manpower by shooting perfectly good soldiers? You just reconstitute them into the next unit to go in. Again, that's Pavlov's house there. Um, and if you actually look at the um, records of how many death penalties were handed down by both sides, both sides shot I think it was about 10 to 15 percent of their own men. Um, I believe the exact number for the Germans was somewhere in the 13,000 range, um, and the Soviets were about 10, 15 percent, something like that. I think it was 10, 15 percent. It was nowhere near what people think it is because it just doesn't make sense. Like if they can still fight, you just reconstitute them into the next unit to go to the front and have them fight, like. Even a lot of the penal battalions, if they were sent to one of those and they survived their, you know, relatively suicidal missions, they'd be sent back to their unit and it'd be as if it, not, it uh, never happened. There's a lot of myths and kind of... It's still, like, 
a mixture of Nazi propaganda and Cold War propaganda that floats around about uh, not just the Red Army in World War II, but the Soviet Army in general, right through the Cold War. Not to say that they were without blemish, but a lot of uh, a lot of the kind of memes that people throw around are very wildly inaccurate or uh, misrep misrepresentative, if I can words. This is the Fallen Fighter Square. As you can see, there is very little detail in it. Oh, we're going to hit the... Yeah. Not my best landing. Definitely not my best landing. But yeah. Um, so the, I'm kind of disappointed that I thought the city would be much more detailed in this. I mean, it's a game based on the Battle of Stalingrad. You'd think the titular city would be a bit more detailed. I think that's Katonnik there that my wingman's flying over. So I gotta say, I'm I'm kind of disappointed that the AI in this fly exactly like they do in Rise of Flight. It's not hard to shoot someone down who just does nothing except engage in flat turns. Um, Cliffs of Dover is definitely kind of the high watermark of AI that are hard to kill. Unless you're landing, then they're really easy to kill. The original IL-246 with the right mods was very similar to Cliffs of Dover in that it was very difficult to get on someone's tail. And even if you did, it was difficult to hit them. Um, they would roll and jink and climb and do all sorts of things. Although, if you got a certain amount of distance behind them, they'd just start infinity climbing in a spiral. So we're going to finish up on that one. It's nice to have a little tour around Stalingrad though, even if it's not as detailed as I'd hoped. I was kind of tempted to do some Cliffs of Dover, but I'm going to have to restart the stream if I want it to hook. So we won't do that, I guess. I'll save that for next stream. I'll um, start with Cliffs of Dover and then go to something else. Let's see. What else can we fly? Let's try the 109. I'm going to die horribly, but we'll try the 109, and we will fly against... Ooh, Spitfire Mark 9s. Oof. I need to get some more of these planes, but I'm broke as fuck. Um, we'll fly against Spitfires, I guess. How do you have so many planes? I pre-ordered this back when I had more money than I do now. Um, I have Battle of Stalingrad, um, Battle of Kuban, and um, what's it called? Um, Rise of Flight 2, that one. Bekatovka, that suburb, um, pretty much dead south of the southern end of Stalingrad, um, was the site of a major prisoner of war camp the Germans ran. A lot of Soviet soldiers died there. When the Soviets liberated it, they, uh, they found that some of the inmates had, had, uh, from what I recall, actually had to resort to cannibalism because the Germans hadn't been feeding them, hadn't been treating any of the multiple epidemics that were going around the place. So you can imagine after the Soviets saw that, they weren't particularly inclined to take care of the Germans either. Um, I mean, they weren't right from the start, but that didn't help. OK. 
Okay, let's see. This view is actually not bad. We'll zoom out just a little. Oh god. Still no artificial horizon in this thing, Jesus. That's a close call for both of them. Dropping the flaps does absolutely nothing re with uh, regards to the aircraft's pitch, which is another reason the flight models in this don't really feel right to me. I really do think that probably they shouldn't have based the uh, the World War II sim off of Rise of Flight because it, fe whoops, it feels like the physics are optimized for World War One birds, not World War Two. I'm not much of a 109 pilot. Definitely not much of a 109 pilot. Oh, he's not having a good day at all. 
His engine's dying on him as well. Yeah, it kind of is, hey. Um, you missed the tour of Stalingrad, by the way. But yeah, I mean, I was going quite fast there. I was doing, what, about 300, 350 kilometers an hour, which is well over the speed you're supposed to drop the flaps at. The flap limit on this is about 250. Drop the flaps, and the aircraft didn't respond at all pitch-wise. Um, if you drop the flaps, at, probably on a 109, certainly on a Spitfire, even at landing speed, as soon as those flaps come down, the nose just goes... Pfft. Like, as I put the flaps out in either DCS or Cliffs of Dover, I'm pulling the nose trim all the way back, or the pitch trim all the way back, all the way nose up, just to account for the fact that as soon as those flaps start deploying, it's just going to nosedive straight on the ground. Oh, wet. Wow! Excuse me! They are Soviet pilots, I guess. That makes sense. Um, yeah, we'll just uh, do that. <laughs> Might try the P-39 again. Well, that's really, really touchy on the controls, which I'm not a fan of. P-39, and we'll go against... Couple of Antons. down to uh, about 80 percent give it a minute to load miss some p39 goodness I uh, am not good at this also the bomber gunners in this are even more prone to sniping than they are in cliffs of Dover so yeah, it didn't go so well. I might make this the last flight for this stream and then take a break and uh, come back on later and do some Cliffs of Dover then. Because Cliffs of Dover is definitely going to be my go-to offline sim. Um, if it was more populated, then I'd probably make it my go-to online as well. But I think this is going to be really the only uh, World War II sim I have that people still play. So this might end up being that. Yeah, it really is. The um, the aviation museum in Edmonton, where the old municipal airport used to be, actually has a whole um, little segment where they've got information about that run they've got photos from it they've got bits of different aircraft and so on it's really really interesting because they came up through Edmonton and then um you know over through the Arctic through Alaska um over the Bering Strait and then through the Far East all the way around Every chance I'll blow the engine, by the way. I don't know the engine limitations of the Allison off the top of my head.
classic DCS nautical cooler, which is unusual for the AI in this. is so bad. Suck on her bad. And I can't get up under the canopy frame to see what's going on. Overheating there for a minute. What are you? That is not friendly. Oh god, neither is the thing behind me. Stop jittering around. Get wrecked. Where the fuck did he go? Track IR head limits in this are really, really bad. Like, incredibly bad. The worst out of any sim I've played for a very long time. It's too restrictive. Especially trying to lean forwards or down. Just can't do it. Like, this is me leaning all the way in. That's as far as I can go. It's nowhere near far enough. to work the radiator on this. No, that's not it. I keep accidentally recording stuff. <laughs> Which drops the frame rate, interestingly. Quite badly at that. This is a uh, P39. Bell P39. By far the Soviet's favourite Lend-Lease fighter. And one of their favourite pieces of Lend-Lease in general. That's one ninety.
get him with the 37. We'll get him with everything else, but not the 37. And it's so twitchy, I just cannot hold it steady. This is what the uh, old IL-2 AI used to do. They get into an infinite spiral climb. So you'd never catch them. I'm getting some hits there though. Apparently not very solid ones, but hits all the same. we pulled up. Almost. Are these 30 cows or 50 cows? They look like 50 cows. Why is he still flying? I've hit him that many times with him. Still overheating. Somehow. Oops. It's fine. We don't need an engine where we're going. Pretty detailed. No, they were different. So there was the Yak Nine T, which had a thirty seven in the nose. Um, but it wasn't very good for anti-aircraft stuff, it was mostly, I've lost too much height, I was going for the airfield but I bled way too much height, um, which was mostly used against tanks because it wasn't very good against aircraft, it wasn't a good stable gun platform and it had a very low rate of fire, um, and the thing was very jarring to shoot. And then some of the later Yak-9s also had 37s, oof, that was close. See what I mean? I didn't make any adjustments to trim there, and I didn't really start pulling on the stick. And yet, as soon as the flaps went out, there was no difference in attitude. The aircraft should pitch nose down when the flaps come out. So, the flight models in this are a bit of a head scratcher on the modern aircraft. On the old uh, World War One planes, they don't have flaps. It doesn't matter. The, like the the old World War One planes seem to handle about as they should, um, just like they did in Rise of Flight, but. I don't know, I'm really dubious about the flight modelling on these World War II planes. I really am. Um, I don't know. Counterpoint, Yak-3. 
um, which the Germans were told not to even go near because it would wreck their shit. Which was essentially the Soviet Spitfire. Very small, very light, could turn inside pretty much anything, including the Spitfire. The only problem is that uh, until right at the end of the war, they didn't have the correct engines for it, so it was quite underpowered. Funnily enough, if you try and bail out on the ground, it'll jettison the canopy, or in this case, the door, but you can't actually get out. Still shoot. Highly effective. The early typhoon had car, <laughs> car doors as well. I much I, I like the early typhoon's aesthetics more than the later one, to be honest, with the bubble canopy. Anyway, I need a rest, because I'm tired as hell. Ever sit in one? No. I have not had the privilege of sitting in any Warbirds unless you count a DC-3, well, a C-47. I sat in the pilot seat of a C-47, but that's it. Finish mission. Right, so, um, I'm quite tired, and, uh, the next thing I was going to stream is Cliffs of Dover, and I'd have to restart the stream to get the uh, to get OBS to hook it, so I'm going to do that later. I'm going to take a break for now. Um, I'll be back online in probably a couple of hours. So for those of you that just arrived, sorry to debate you. Um, I'll, I'll give you my summary of, of this so far. First of all, I've been spoilt by full fidelity and like partial fidelity sims, so... Um, DCS and Cliffs of Dover have ruined me. I don't like not being able to click things now, like it physically annoys me to not be able to click things now. Um, what else? Sorry, I'm just looking at the map. Okay, no, Pitomnik was further west, I was wrong. Yeah, that's Shvolny. Then Pitomnik's there, Gumrak is there. These are all satellite airfields, Pitomnik was the big one. And Karpovka is about as far as the encirclement went, so they basically went around the river here, on both sides. Um, yeah, uh, not not having a couple pit pisses me off. Um, graphically, the game's quite pretty, although it's kind of slightly uncanny. It it feels uh, a bit more stylized, I guess, than I would be used to. Um, Rise of Flight did too, but in Rise of Flight, I don't know, it felt less off-putting than this. Um, off-putting is probably not the right word, but whatever. Um, the actual terrain isn't actually as detailed as I thought it would be. Like, the city itself is really pretty low in detail, which I was kind of sad about. Especially considering that, you know, you do have ground vehicles in this now. Um, speaking of which, uh, I need to learn how to use them. There's so many binds I can't remember. The aircraft themselves, uh, they look okay. They're not as detailed as either DCS or Cliffs of Dover, um, but they're not bad. The I like how they've done the gun sights. The reflector gun sights actually look like they're being reflected onto a, a piece of glass, um, unlike DCS and Cliffs of Dover. So that's a point in its favour. Um, the track IR head limits are really, really bad. Like, really, really bad. I cannot lean forwards or back, so I can't see half my instruments without zooming in. And then if something's in the way, I can't see them at all. Um, and it's hard to keep track of things under canopy framing in certain aircraft. Um, I don't know why it's like that, but that's just what they've done. Um, the sound is good. The game runs pretty well as long as I have the sharpen filter turned off and I'm not running the 4K textures. The flight models though are the big sticking point for me. They don't feel right. Um, they really don't feel as uh, alive, for lack of a better term, as the flight models in DCS or Cliffs of Dover. 
the um, damage models are like DCS or worse kind of level. Um, really, if, if I had to describe it in terms of the flying, um, both the aircraft flight models and the damage models, this feels like IL-2 1946, just with better graphics. And IL-2 1946 is now like, what, 15 years old or more? It's a really old sim. Um, so, yeah, I'm not real sure about that. Um, with that said, I mean, it's a pretty game. It runs well. It actually has people playing it online, which is more than I can say for Cliffs of Dover, as far as I know. Um, and certainly more than I can say for DCS World War II. So probably this will have to be my go-to online World War II sim, although, to be quite frank with you, I would rather fly in Cliffs of Dover or um, DCS if DCS wasn't a broken piece of shit and people actually played World War II DCS. So yeah, it's it's been an interesting uh, first try of the game. I'm, I'm not sure if, you know, with time it'll mature a bit more and the, the flying uh, side of things will become a bit better. Um, I'm also not sure really if the devs are aiming to make it more of a full sim or if they're happy to leave it in kind of that middle ground that IL-2, uh, the original game, and things like Strike Fighters Inhabit where they're um, complex enough to not be ace combat but also arcadey enough to not be considered a true sim. Like... We're talking kind of war, uh, war Thunder levels of flight model complexity here. To me, that's what it feels like. And, I mean, you guys know how much I rag on War Thunder's flight models, so... Oh well, um, we've got the game set up at least, and we've got some basic binds in, so... I can play it more and I can get used to it, and we'll we'll see how we go. I might warm to it over time, but for now, I'm, I'm kind of not as blown away as I'd hoped to be by it. But, uh, yeah, I will catch you guys probably, um, I don't know how long I'll sleep for, a couple of hours probably, um, and I will be doing some more Clips of Dover, and then, who knows, after that, I might do some more Project Reality, or, sorry, some more Squad, um, not PR, or um, something along those lines, maybe Tarkov or whatever. In the meantime, uh, I will pass you along to someone else. We'll see who. Ah, Dub's still streaming. Okay, you can go say hi to him. Alrighty, guys. Thanks for watching. Catch you later.